Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mr. Steele, and I'm here to deliver the lesson that I'm unable to deliver today because I am in Nevada. Actually, at about this time, I'm probably at the Planetarium Show on the campus of University of Nevada at Reno. So um, I'll be looking up at fake stars. So you're going to be looking at fake solid objects. So um, our goal for today is to kind of extend what we did yesterday. Yesterday, we began calculating the volume of solids of revolution, which just meant that we were going to take a region in two dimensions, and then we were going to create like a pseudo paper lantern out of it by basically you know, layering a whole bunch of those things around in a circle, creating a three-dimensional object whose cross-sections are all circular. And just like those um, solids with known cross-sections we did last week on Friday, the idea is if we can just figure out the area for each representative circle, we can sum them up with an integral and create and find the actual volume of the solid of revolution for that 3D object. So today we're going to kind of do the same thing. We're just going to um, extend it by looking at objects that don't have quite a pretty situation, where our region is nice and you know everything works out perfectly. Like in today, we're going to have problems because we'll have 3D regions that actually have holes in them and cavities. And you know what are we going to do when those cavities appear? So um, basically, we're going to take a look at those guys. The method we're going to use is called volume by washers. Um, so before we start, it might be useful to um, explain why it is called volume by washers. The reason is, um, if any of you are ever in scouts, how many of you are in scouts? Oh, interesting. Okay, so that many, huh? How high did you go in scouts? Okay, no, I'm just kidding. I'm, obviously, I can't hear what you're saying or even see if you're raising your hands. Basically, a washer is something that you use when you build stuff. And the washer looks like this. It's basically a ring. It's usually metallic colored. This is black. This isn't metallic covered, colored. But it's basically just a ring. Like, that is a washer. And you use it to make, usually, so that a nail or a screw isn't flush against the wall can't remember off the top of my head what the rationale is behind that, but that's okay. Because basically, here is an example of a washer. The reason we're going to call this the washer method today is that whenever we look at the cross-sections of the objects that we create, um, the three-dimensional solids of revolution, they're all going to have a cross-section that's in the form of a ring or a washer, just like this guy. Basically, there's one circle, and then there's another circle that represents the space that's taken out of it. So as you can kind of expect, we're going to be using a lot of the same techniques as yesterday. We're just going to have a little bit of um, a couple little twists and stuff that'll come up. So um, hopefully you've gotten the sheet of paper that has all of the um, like problems and information stuff that we're going to use today, so that I can go a little bit faster through this because you know this takes forever and I'm sitting here on Sunday doing it all. So I want to be done as quickly as possible, and I want to give you time to just practice this and work with it because I think it's I think it'll work pretty well if you were comfortable with yesterday's lesson. So to start off with, we're going to calculate the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by y equals 3 and y equals x on the interval 0 to 3 about the x-axis. So as far as when you read this guy, it doesn't sound like it's all that different from a problem yesterday. There's nothing that's going to clue us in yet as to you know the issues here. So the first thing I'm going to do, just like yesterday, is kind of sketch out what my region looks like. Because I need an idea for my region if I want to ever have hopes of actually drawing the three-dimensional object itself. So first of all, these aren't beautiful straight lines, I'm sorry. My region is the region between y equals 3 and y equals x on 0 to 3. So basically, my region itself, the one that's going to be revolved, is basically this guy. We can go ahead and think of this thing as r. My region is this little triangular section. So beautiful, though it is. In fact, I'm going to label it R, just so that I can keep calling it that. And basically, this little guy is what we are going to take and spin around on or about the x-axis. So as we look at it, again, it might not jump out at you right away, but because of the process that we use for actually revolving these things, we would end up reflecting this guy down here, and we'd end up with some sort of three-dimensional object like this. Well, you know what? That's not a good picture. So I'm going to go ahead and draw it again, being a little more careful this time. So you can kind of see from the spinning that the outside, that top line, that horizontal line is going to end up on the outside, whereas this guy is going to end up on the inside. And as you look at it, basically, if you imagine the spinningness, we're going to end up with that sort of region. We're going to have this big old cylinder, kind of, and then we're going to have this empty little cavity on the inside, like basically like a cone was sucked out and torn out clean from the inside of a cylinder. Kind of a weird shape, but you know, it's you know not all that unreasonable. It's kind of like an old-fashioned pencil 
sharpener. Like you stick the pencil into this region, and then it would like do the little shaving and stuff, and then it would come back out. So you know, if you can see it, great. If not, don't worry about it. The reason I'm gonna say don't worry about it is because, huh? I have a better way of looking at this region. So what I have is I have an applet that's from um, Pennsylvania State University, the Penn State that's in um, Happy Valley, as far as I know. And this applet will allow us to actually like create that three-dimensional solid, the one that I'm trying to um, feebly create right here, to see what it is we're actually trying to create. So as of right now, I've put in the two functions. I've got f of x equals x and g of x equals 3. I'm going on the interval a equals 0, b equals 3. So I'm going from 0 to 3, revolving it about the line y equals 0, because that's the x-axis. And right now, I'm not using any washers. So basically, I'm going to change this number so we can start to see what's happening here, like what these cross-sections and everything look like. So let's say I switch it and do five washers. So as you can see, these little like pinkish things appear. Well, as we look at it, we can actually kind of see the solid being created. It's not perfect because there's all these gaps in it. You can kind of see it looks like a CD stacker or something right now. But as you look, you can kind of see like a little triangle going through there. And you can kind of see the perspective happening here. So as I pick more and more, because this thing's just approximating the volume, if I pick more and more, we start to see the solid come to life a little bit better. Just there we go, we're starting to see that circle thing. Kind of reminds you of the end of Looney Tunes, right? We're starting to see it kind of in there. There, if you turn it, if I get it just right, you can kind of see the triangle in the middle, that cone that's been pulled out. And then if I just go all the way up, so I go to 100, there you can really see it kind of happening in there. That dark triangle is that cone, the cavity, that space that's open in there. We've got that stuff on the outside, the actual like cylinder part, comes being pulled out of. Look at that. Isn't that just gorgeous? You can see the perspective there really effectively. So there we go. There is our three-dimensional object that we're trying to create here. Like this is the solid we want. So the question is, well, how? Okay, great. This thing says the volume is approximately 56.55. How are we going to calculate that? Like what is it that we're going to have to do in this case? What I'm going to do is I am going to redraw this thing a lot bigger so that I can use some colors and stuff. So again, I know I've got that beautiful picture, that beautiful rendering from Penn State right there, but you know, I'm a self-sufficient man. I'm going to draw it myself and probably run into a whole bunch of problems as I do. And so now, basically I've got some colors already up here. I'm going to use those colors to as good effect as I can. So basically I've got this top function at y equals 3. It's going to be reflected down here down to y equals negative 3. Don't worry about the scale. I'm not too worried about that right now. I'm saying it's 3. We'll deal with it. Then we've got the line y equals x. So there's that guy. And that's, that's, that's just abysmal. And there we go. So you can kind of see our little region there. Try to shrink it a little bit. I know this isn't perfect when, but you know, who can compare to that, right? I mean, that's, ooh, 3D. I mean, that's intense. So we'll stick with this, though, for the moment. So anyway, here is our little region. So there's our three-dimensional object. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw in that representative circle for each one. I want to see if maybe we can figure out what the radius is there. Because in reality, what we want is we want a way to relate the radius of the circle or whatever shape comes up, the disk, you know, the washer, with the functions that we know. So again, I'm going to use the colors, and you know what, I'm going to start with the inner one. I'm going to start with this little guy on the inside. So basically, no I'm not, I lied. Let's start with the biggest one here. So as I want to figure out what the area is of the washers that's formed on the outside here. So I've drawn that red circle in. That red circle is going to represent the outer radius. It's going to represent the big washer up here. So basically what I just traced was this part of the washer. Now I know I didn't trace it literally. Stop making fun of me. It's okay. So there is that guy. And what I want to think about is what is the radius of that thing in terms of the information that I know. And since it's the bigger of the radii, as we'll see in a second, I'm going to call that big R. So my question is, what is that length? Like, how can I represent that? At any time period, what is the length of that radius? Well, as we look, no matter where we put that washer, or this outer thing, the radius is going to be 3, because this function right up here is y equals 3. 
So the big radius in this case is equal to 3. No matter what, it's always going to be 3. And in fact, we said that the outer shape here is kind of like a cylinder. You can actually see that. If I cut out this function, like you can actually see this is just a solid cylinder. Like the outer part of this guy is just that. It's just a cylinder. So out here, I've got my big radius. Now what about the little guy? What about that inner function? Like we basically need to figure out what is the expression for the radius inside here. I'm gonna switch to blue, that looks, it's just not doing it for me. What is the radius? I don't have just normal blue, geez. My goodness, there we go. So I'm gonna switch to normal blue because we wanna know what is the length in here. So as I look up at this picture, that guy is going to be, or that circle for that hole is going to be right here. Again, apologies for not being a very good drawing. And this radius is going to be represented right there. Well, the length of that does depend on the where we're at, because basically if I draw that little radius right there, it's you know a certain distance. If I draw it right here, or I pretend like I'm drawing it and then do a horrible job. If I draw this one, the radius is a little smaller. If I draw this one, the radius is bigger. So the question is, how can I represent that littler radius, the one that's a little smaller than r equals 3? Well, again, think about the function. This function is y equals x. So the little radius here is equal to x. And it's going to give us our expression for how high that cavity is each time. So let's take a look at that cavity. Let's you know take a look and see. You know What does it look like? Well, I'm just kidding. Well, let's take a look at that cavity. Let's just take a look and see. You know, what does this thing actually look like? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of this three. And now this shape that we're seeing, it's gonna be filled in here. But in reality, this is representing the cavity that's in there. This is the cone that we're taking out of that middle of that cylinder. Like there it is, you can kind of see it. It looks pretty snazzy for as far as cones go. You know, nice right circular cone. Nothing cool about it. And basically we can see that the radius of that circle varies depending on where we're at. It's really big right here. It's actually equal to 3 right there, whereas it's a little smaller down at the beginning. In fact, it's 0. So it looks like we've actually identified the right stuff here. This represents the inside of the function. And of course, the entire thing is represented right here. And we can see that cavity. There's that cone that was taken out right inside. Wish I had different colors, but that's okay. So lovely, we've got our big radius and our small radius. Yesterday, because everything was nice and solid, it was just one big radius. Today, we've got these cavities and holes in the middle. We've got to be a little more careful. So from here, basically what we're going to do is we're going to integrate the exact same thing as we did before. We're going to do basically a whole bunch of areas, and we're going to sum them all up with an integral. The problem here is, of course, you know what's the formula for the area of a ring? Well, if we think about it, the area of a ring is just going to be the difference between the areas of the two circles around it. So we're going to subtract two different areas. The big area, the first one, is going to be pi big R squared, because that's going to be the area of this entire thing, like the entire circle where there are no hole taken out of it. And then from there, we are going to get the area of the ring itself by subtracting the area of the hole, which in this case is going to be pi little r squared. So it's basically this guy was yesterday. Today we get the new one because we basically have to subtract those two pi, the smaller pi r squared to represent what's on the inside. So for this problem, where we would go is we'd go right to our integral. We already know r and little big r and little r in terms of x. In this case it's 3 and x. Those are our guys. So in order to get our volume, it would be the integral of this guy. We would just integrate that expression. So for this first one, I'm going to go ahead and separate the pi out. Is that okay? Does anyone not want me to do that? Great, I don't see any hands. So I'm going to pull out the pi. I'm going to get the integral of big R squared. Well, we'll do that in a second, sorry. Minus pi. Pulled out the pi from both of them. So now big R squared. We already said big R squared is 3. So we've got 3 squared. And then little r is going to be, it says over here, x. So we're going to subtract the x squared. And of course, if we distribute in the pi, pi times 3 squared, pi times x squared. And of course, from there, what we'll do is we said there's the area of the ring. 
that we're adding up, so we're going to subtract those guys. We're integrating in terms of x, and our integral, well, it told us right there. It says it's going from 0 to 3. So this guy should give us the volume of this expression, which, again, we know just from looking at our little cool little toy from Penn State is somewhere around 56.5. So let's see, what does this come out to be? Well, I'm not going to always or do all the actual calculations today, but I'm going to for now. I've got the integral from 0 to 3 of 9 minus x squared dx. Pretty easy integral as far as integrals go. We're going to get that's pi times 9x minus 1 third x cubed, which we are then going to evaluate from 0 to 3. That's going to give me pi times... 9 times 3 is 27. 1 third of 27 is 9. And of course, the other one is just pi times 0, like both those guys are go to 0, which means that our volume, our good estimate, or our exact volume for this particular solid should be 18 pi. Now, the question is well, about how big is 18 pi? Well, 18 is approximately 18, and pi is just a little more than 3. So, 18 times 3 is 54. We should expect our volume to be a little bit more than 54. 56.54, yeah, it sounds pretty good. It sounds pretty good to me. I like it. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. that is the exact area, or volume, excuse me, volume of this particular three-dimensional solid, like this solid of revolution. So basically, as we see here, before we get into the formalities and we do the, you know, some interesting, more interesting examples, basically what we saw was we were able to take care of three-dimensional solids, solids of revolution, that have holes in them, you know, basically empty regions by just subtracting out the radius for that empty region. We're basically just calculating the area of a ring and then integrating with that. So what we're going to do from here on is I'm going to talk about the theory and like give you the kind of the general formula. And technically, you can already see it because it's on that sheet that you got. But at the same time, we'll look at that formula, we'll talk about when it works, like what are the catches, you know, what do we need to look at. Then from there, I'll do a couple examples. One where you have to do a little bit more work just to reiterate this process. One where we do it, you know, about a different axis because, you know, that can kind of be catchy, you know, and you have to change stuff. And then one where you have to use the calculator. Hopefully I can go through them quickly enough. I'm probably going to save myself time by not doing the actual calculations on here, except for maybe the calculator one. Um, I'll just tell you what the volume is, and then you can, you know, check it yourself afterwards. So from here, moving forward... The idea we're looking at today is volume by washers, and you know when do you find this? Well, it happens anytime we actually have a solid of revolution where the region we're revolving has some sort of empty space in the middle. Like it's not just flush against the axis of revolution. So the solid volume by washers. So now what do we have here? Well, you can kind of see a whole bunch of different stuff. So um, the explanation here for everything. Let's just a second, I'm gonna use a different color. This first guy, this first expression, I mean, okay, so honestly, yeah, these expressions are pretty similar. We've just changed x to y's. What are we looking at, though? This first expression is for when we're revolving about the x-axis. Technically, it's also about any horizontal line, but for now, let's stick with the x-axis. We'll do the shifted stuff tomorrow. So this is when we're revolving about the x-axis. It's pi times the integral of the area formula, which for a ring happens to be this guy, or for a washer happens to be big R squared minus little r squared. Just pi big R squared minus pi little r squared. As far as what we look at in our actual region, this is actually doing pi times the integral of top minus bottom. So as we look at our function relative to the axis of rotation, we can figure out which one is which by looking at the top function. So if you go back to our pretty little function here, the top function was the horizontal line y equals 3. The bottom function, as relative to this axis of rotation that's red right now, was y equals x. Therefore, when we went and did this, we did 3 was our big radius, our first one, x was our little radius. So for this guy, it works out pretty nicely. Like nothing really fancy there. The second one, down here with the y, obviously the shift is, instead, we're going to be revolving about the y-axis. And because I didn't realize up until this moment when I'd already started writing the words revolving, I didn't copy and paste this down and just change the letter x to y. So I'm going to write it again. It's going to be more beautiful and glorious than the last one, though. So revolving about the y-axis. So for this guy, lovely. We haven't done one like this yet. We'll, we'll get there. Basically here instead, still the same exact formula, almost. It's still an integral, but as you can see, it's dy. And here, 
just like you know we talked about before when we were doing just plain old area. This time it's going to be the right function squared minus the wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Minus the left function squared. Because how can you ever really have a wrong function? So there we go. So in this case, either situation we're prepared for. We're basically just going to do the big R and little R instead of just doing the plain old regular R. Last term, a bunch of people complained because it used to make you actually draw that little circle off to the side like the washer. This pretty cool one up here. This used to be in every single problem kind of thing. I'm not going to ask you to do that anymore because I think if you're really careful here and you just draw them onto your picture, you'll be fine. And then each time we do one of these problems, I'm going to try to use the applet, at least for the ones that are revolved around the uh, an x-axis. We'll use this applet because that applet's ridiculously awesome. Don't you agree? Oh, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I love it too. Me too. See, everyone loves that applet. I mean, it's just like the best thing in the world. Right next to sliced bread. Although with all that carb craze, like sliced bread's kind of fallen down the power rankings of awesome. So I shouldn't talk. So anyway, here we go. Volume by washers. It's not that different than yesterday. We're just subtracting another little r squared from our integrand. So what we're going to do is I'm going to move on to the next problem. You can probably guess which one the next problem is because it's the next problem on your sheet. We are going to calculate the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by y equals 1 minus x squared and y equals 1 minus x about the x-axis. So the purpose of this particular problem is just to reiterate that process we just went through. Like what did we do now that we've got some idea about the theory here? You know, how do I apply that all together? How do I draw it? Does it work? All that stuff. So we're going to look at that right about now. And we're going to begin by going ahead and drawing this region. Okay, so yeah, let's go draw it and sketch this region and figure it all out and do all these wonderful things. But wait, I don't even know where these guys intersect yet. Like, it didn't give me that helpful little interval like this guy had sitting right about here. Like, I need to know where they're intersecting first. So just like with a regular area problem back in the day, we have to first figure out where these two functions intersect. So I'm going to do that kind of off to the side. I'll do it like, I don't know, right about here. So I need to figure out when does 1 minus x squared equal 1 minus x. Again, you might be able to figure it out just by looking at it, but, you know, we'll see. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. I'm going to get rid of those guys. Then I'm going to add x squared to both sides. Like you've done algebra stuff all the time. I'm not too worried about it. So we get 0 equals x squared minus x, which means 0 equals x, x minus 1, which means that these two functions are going to intersect at 0 and 1. So our integral interval for our integral, our interval for our integral is going to go from 0 to 1. Awesome. So now that I know where they're intersecting, I know that I'm really just looking at the first and fourth quadrants. First quadrant for my region, fourth quadrant for the reflection, for the, you know, when we actually do the revolution part. So let's go ahead and draw that in here. Again, I'll let the Penn State applet, you know, make it look pretty afterwards. So, terrible. It was terrible. There is my stuff. So my region here, 1 minus x squared is a parabola. It's going to start right there. It's going to go down. So there's that first guy. Oh, I should be coloring this. Jeez. No good person avoids color. So our first function is the parabola. About right there. And then, you know, of course it will be reflected. So I might as well throw that in right now too. So there's that part. So right now, if that was it, you know, we'd just have a nice disk with method problem. There'd just be one little radius. But alas, we have 1 minus x, which is just a line, slope 1. And actually, that kind of worked. It's just, oh man, this is hard. There's that one. There's that one. So basically, we have our little picture drawn already here. So we're ready to go. Now we want to start figuring out all the stuff. We need to know our big radius and our little radius. So last time I started with the big radius, this time I'm going to start with the little radius. You know, basically I need to know what is the inside one like well in this case we're trying to figure out what is the you know piece of the cavity ah uh, you know what take that back let's just look at the picture on the actual applet so as of right now there's zero here let's see if I plug in so this thing does it look right got some sort of round object there we go with the triangle kind of taken out of it I'd say that's pretty close to what we have here you know what let's do 100 just to make sure there we go we can see it empty space in the middle here and then this round object that's going to be around it. So now, where would this come from? What would this look like? I don't know. A sculpture of an onion that someone took a cone out of. I don't know. I'm not an artist. Sue me. No, don't, don't really sue me. I don't have a lawyer. So, our little radius. We're talking about this guy right here. This adorable little inner ring. 
inner circle. So that guy, we want to know what is the radius of this guy. Well, probably not hard to guess. Like that line is 1 minus x, so I'm guessing our radius is probably going to be 1 minus x. Next guy, the big one. Now what's that big guy on the outside? That big guy, well, first of all, let's draw it. Let's just color it in. It's fun to color things. So there it is. As far as this one's radius, that was a terrible attempt at a radius. Very patriotic colored solid of revolution here. Our big radius, the one on the outside, is, well, once again, it's determined by 1 minus x squared. So if you can believe it, it's just going to be 1 minus x squared. So there we go. We've got our big and small radius. Only thing left is to actually take those guys down and actually do the integral. So again, I'm just going to set up and give you the answer. I'm not going to actually do the work. So looking at this guy, our volume, it's about the x-axis. So again, we're revolving it this way, as you can probably guess from our picture and everything. So our volume is going to be equal to, oh, huh? heck with this. We've got this beautiful picture up here already. Let's just use it. This guy is going to give us our volume. So there it is. So we want to use this expression. Well, looking at it, I'll get the pi. So it's going the integral from pi. Our limits of integration, as it shows over here, are 0 and 1. So why not use them with a pretty rich green color? Looks like an R. I'll fix it. 0 to 1. And then as far as our stuff here, we've got our big radius is 1 minus x squared which means our first part of our integrand is going to be 1 minus x squared. Square it, because of course that's a radius, so we have to square it in the pi r squared formula. And then the inner guy is going to be 1 minus x, which again, we shall square. And then the only thing left is just the formalities of sticking in the difference, because we're subtracting those guys for the ring. And then, of course, not forgetting dx. So this guy, from here, we would be able to evaluate. We would have to multiply out some binomials, We'd have to distribute a negative sign. Lots of little places to get caught, although that 0 to 1 thing makes it kind of nice. We'd have some stuff simplify. And either way, we would do work. And we would end up with a volume of pi over 5. So now how big is that? Well, pi is a little bit more than 3. So 3 over 5 is 0 0.6. So this should be a little bit more than 0 0.6. Let's look at our appellate. So since we went up to n equals 100, 100 individual washers here, I feel like we've got a pretty good approximation of our little pitcher here. This nice little bowl. <laughs> That's what it's like. It's like a bowl. This guy, and it says the volume is about 0.628, which I'm going to go ahead and say is pretty nifty for this guy. So once again, it appears that we have calculated out the volume of a cool little object with a cavity. So good job us. Pat yourself on the back, or if you can't reach your back, have someone around you that you trust pat you on the back. Just not too hard, because that would be hurting. So good job. Let's look at another example. OK, so next example. I said we're going to look at one where we're going about the y-axis, and in fact we are. We want to calculate the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by x squared and x cubed about the y-axis. We're going to have to be really careful here. I speak from experience, because I just did the entire last problem incorrectly because I didn't pay attention to um, some of the stuff on here and that means I have to redo this entire thing which is really really frustrating but oh well deal with it so what are we going to do first thing we need to figure out where these two guys intersect using the magic of we've done problems just like this a bajillion times at this point well not a bajillion like maybe 10 we should know that they intersected 0 and 1 one's an even one's an odd function they intersected only 0 and 1 so good we got those guys Next thing we want to do is we want to draw these guys. And I don't have the benefit of the applet behind me this time. I can't actually go graph this one out and just pull it out without doing some um, funky little tricks. Because that applet is limited to revolving about a horizontal line of rotation. So I'm actually stuck with just this guy. Between x squared and x cubed. I'm going to trust that I can probably do it. So, lovely s. Yes. That's terrible. I'm just, I'm, that's terrible. I'm not going to do that. Okay, so I'm trying to sketch my little region here. I'm trying to prepare. I know it's revolving about the y-axis, so you know I'm only given the top part because I can tell it's in, you know, it's positive, all that good stuff. So now I'm gonna graph these guys. So y equals x squared. So just graphing a little parabola. 
Okay, so now technically that's that's not accurate. Technically, zero to one. I'm graphing this parabola, and then I'm gonna reflect it over here afterwards. So there, that should please the people that argue out there. And then next I've got y equals x cubed. Well yeah, normally x cubed is bigger than y equals x squared, but on this particular interval from zero to one, x cubed is actually the smaller function, so it has lower values here. If you don't believe me, I think we've mentioned this before. Go ahead and take, you know, I don't know, um, you know, x equals one half and see what happens when you square it versus cubing it. Which one's bigger? So we had the correct one. So okay, these are both ugly, let's fix them. The ones I had last time were beautiful. So there's that. So again, not a perfect rendering. Close enough. There we go. So what kind of three-dimensional shape are we getting here? We're actually getting a um, like a bowl, just like the last one, except now instead of having completely flat, you know, diagonal lines like on the inside, like for that inner thing, it's not a cone anymore. It's like this little like snow globe kind of thing on top that's being pulled out of the three-dimensional shape. So from here, we're like, okay, great. Let's start. Let's get to work. Well, now, the thing that's kind of awkward here is as we go through, it's no longer going to be top minus bottom. As we said back here, since we're going about the y-axis, everything's in terms of y. Now we're going right function squared minus left function squared. So as we look at this guy, I can go ahead and draw out the first radius, or the first disk. So like this one represents the outside of the function the outer function, in this case the right function. And if we want to figure out what its radius is, well it's dependent on this graph. But of course we're going about the y-axis. We need these guys to be in terms of y. So in this case we need to write that x is equal to the cube root of y. And so when we look at the big radius here, the ones determined by the right function, that's going to be equal to the cube root of y. Again, if you're not sure, just kind of think about it a little bit. You know, we're going about the y-axis. Everything's determined by the y, you know, those values out there. And again, the right function, the one that's outside here, the one that's going to produce the bigger radius, is cube root of y. So great, got that. Nice, good job, us. Second, we want to do the little guy. Well, you know, let's draw it first. It's always fun to draw our stuff. So there's that guy. There's that one. So the radius we're going to have for this guy, going right to there, that little radius is going to be again in terms of y. So if I convert it, I get x equals the square root of y. So my little radius is square root of y. So with that said, I am prepared to go ahead and jump into my integral. So I've got this stuff ready, I've got my two radii, now I'm ready to actually do this by adding up all those areas of all those little rings that we're looking at. So volume is equal to pi not just pi, otherwise the problem would be over. Pi times the integral, so by adding up all those little areas. So in this case, we're going to be I'm just kind of setting it up so I don't have to dig into those colors all the time. We're integrating in terms of y, and we're going to subtract those two functions. First, our intersection points were 0 and 1. That was in terms of x, so you know, think about it in terms of x, but since it's in terms of y, we have to think about the y's. Well, 0 x equals 0 implies y equals 0, and x equals 1 implies y equals 1 also. So we're actually safe there. These are nice regions Regions in that case. So we got the boundaries. Next we need the actual functions. So in this case, the right function was cube root of y. So we're going to get cube root of y squared. And then we're going to take away the smaller radius, the one that gives us the radius of the cavity. That's going to be the square root of y squared. And so this integral will be the one that actually gives us our volume. And if you do the work, which I'm not going to for the sake of time, we get the volume of this particular solid revolved about the y-axis is y equals 10. So there we go, y equals 10, or y equals 10, pi over 10. The volume is pi over 10. So there we go, it seems reasonable, kind of small. So now as far as our applet, I said we can't actually do this one. Well, we can't. But you can turn your head 90 degrees and then look at the graphs of those functions, square root of y and cube root of y, with x playing the role of y. If we do that, we do in fact end up with a solid like this, which again matches pretty closely what we have if you turn your head to the side. And then if we move this around, it looks pretty reasonable. It looks a lot like our graph that we are looking for. Kind of cool. 
And if we notice, our volume is 0 0.314. That's pretty close to pi over 10. So in fact, it looks like we've probably done this pretty accurately. Looks like we've once again calculated the volume of the solid. So good job us. So we are pretty much done. The only thing I want to do is show you how to do this on the calculator because this can be a little bit weird or it can be a little bit annoying. It should be a direct extension from yesterday. Sometimes it doesn't work out that well. So let's take a look at a calculator example next. Okay, so calculator example. Last thing we want to look at. So and again, I sound a little frustrated it's because I just made the entire video. It worked out perfectly for this last part and then it just didn't save. Got distracted and didn't save. Very frustrating. So from here what do we want to do? We want to use the calculator in order to um, figure out the volume for this particular region between 4 sine of x and x minus 1 squared. It's being revolved about the x-axis. So first thing I want to do is I need to figure out where the intersection points are and I need to figure out how to sketch this region because you know it's not a simple one. Like I know this is a parabola and this is a periodic sine curve but the intersection itself, the region that might be formed as well as the volume of the solid kind of awkward so I'm going to need to actually take a look at that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to graph the calculator. This has to be a calculator question question anyway and the reason I know that is that I don't have any way to solve 4 sine of x equals x minus 1 squared. So I need to go in here and graph those guys. So 4 sine of x and the second one which was x minus 1 squared. Window range. Okay, I will quit. Let's fix the window range. Let's just zoom standard. Who cares? If Tony taught me that, I'll do that. So there's my sine curve my parabola should be somewhere here there it is so my region is right in that spot hopefully you can see my mouse so I'm going to zoom in on that region and go from maybe 0 to 4 in the x's and since I know the maximum value of sine is 4 I'm going to go 0 to 5 so just a little above it so again it's going to graph it I just want to see my region a little bit better so I'm going to actually do this all with the calculator so there it is there's my stuff so what I'm going to do, let's do this, screenshot. Because what I want to do now is I want to sketch it over here and you know color it, figure out the radii, and set up the integral. Because I'm going to do everything else on the calculator. So let's take a screenshot. No, it's not going to let me do that. Really frustrating. Okay, so there's that. So here is my picture. So I'm going to paste this puppy right in. And then I'm going to take it, and I'm going to flip it so that I don't have to sketch the stinking region again. Jeez, oh, this is so frustrating when you have everything working and then it all stops. Okay. Jeez, why is this an issue? Close enough. It's just the thing being a problem. Okay, so there's our region. Looks pretty good. Nice. Now the problem is we didn't actually find our intersection points. So we need to go to the calculator and ask it to find the intersection points. So I'm going to go to second calculate, do the intersection points. We go first curve, second curve. I'm going to guess that it's somewhere around 3. And it's going to tell me that my intersection point is at 2.523. So one intersection point here is at x equals 2.523. If it sounds like I wasn't very surprised by that, it's because, again, I just did this entire problem and had it erased. So second one, let's do the same thing. Second calculate, we want to find that left intersection point. We'll go first curve, second curve. I'm going to guess it happens somewhere around 1. It should be close enough to get me to that in one. And that intersection point is 0.172. So x equals 0. 0.172. So that's what those points are. 0.172, 2.523. So we got our boundaries. Next, though, we need to figure out all the stuff so we can set up our integral. So in this case, I'm going to just color over my graphs here and draw the radii and stuff from there. So as far as my region itself, I've got the sine of x part, the 4 sine x, right there. So it is the same thing down here. There is that piece. And then in blue, I've got the parabola part. So what's kind of awkward about this region is that they actually like it actually touches itself as it goes down. Well, I could actually model it very nicely. It actually hits and it's actually touching both halves or both of the reflected sides 
are touching right there. Does that matter? Not really. It's just kind of an awkward thing to look at. So for now, when I draw my representative washer, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to do it off to the side so I don't have that mess. I want to be able to see the radius in here. So I'm going to draw it right there. So the inside one I'm going to do first. The radius for that little r is going to be, well, it's just the blue function, which is x minus 1 squared. So we have to be careful when we do the actual integral part because that squared is different than the squared that we get from r squared. But for now we're okay. So there's that guy. Then next I'm going to draw the big one. I'm just going to go right there. So this guy's radius is represented by the top function. In this case it's 4 sine of x. So again, nothing particularly different about these guys. We just had to enlist the help of the calculator a little bit. So great, they're here. What are we going to do? We're going to set up the integral for the volume. So the first part, the v equals pi, the integral symbol, they're there. I'm going to set up everything else so I don't have to later. So it's all in terms of x. The reason I know it's in terms of x is because we're revolving about the x-axis. Got the minus sign in the middle. So next, what else do we need? Well, let's put in the boundaries, the limits of integration. That'll be 0.172 is the smaller one, going up to 2.523. And then next, we're going to have the big and little ones. So for this first guy, we're going to take 4 sine of x, and we're going to square that. For the second one, we are going to take x minus 1 squared, and we're going to square that. So again, a little awkward, they're both being squared twice, like the squared is different than the one from the pi r squared. So okay, so what do we do from here? Well, we go back to our calculator and say calculator do the work for us. So, okay. Going in here, unfortunately having those two functions there isn't going to help us. There are ways we can make it help us, but it's not particularly helpful now. So instead, I'm going to actually plug in the entire integrand here, as well as the pi, just so that I can integrate that, or I can let the calculator use its integrating capabilities to figure out what the volume is. So first things first, I got pi. I say I'm going to multiply it times the entire integrand. So I've got the first, I've got 4 sine x. Got to be really careful with the parentheses here. So 4 sine of x enclosed squared minus x minus 1 squared. And that whole thing is also squared. So that's the puppy I'm going to graph. So I'm going to graph that guy. Um, from experience from the last time, I'm just going to change my window a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and raise the maximum value to about this high, just so we can look at it. And so here is the, the graph of our integrand. So what we want to do is we want to figure out what is the integral of that, because that would represent our volume. So our lower limit was 0.17. Two. Our upper limit was 2.523. Hopefully this guy will integrate it really quickly. I think that curves actually the graph of what do you call it, the area of each ring that's there from those two regions. And so it appears that according to this calculator, our answer is that the volume of this guy is 69.806. 69.806. That would be our volume. And so now, as cool as that is, like, let's go and actually ask the applet to, um, let's check the applet really fast and see if that thing agrees. So, let's do that. So, pretend that's not there. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to figure out what is this thing actually coming out to be. So, you can kind of see the remnants from when I did it before. <coughs> okay. So, looking at the applet. Hopefully, it works this time. So we've got first our outer function, 4 times the sine of x. Our second function is x minus 1 squared. We're starting at our a value. Like right now we don't have anything, so don't look at it. Our a value for this guy is 0 0.172. Our a value over here, or our b value, is 2.523. It's revolved about y equals 0. So now, as of right now, the volume is zero. It seems like we screwed something up. Let's put in 100 things, and there it says our volume should be 69.808. So that's pretty close to 69.806, and this is all approximation. The coolest thing, though, is look at that graph. Isn't that cool? It looks like a UFO. Look at that. It's like a UFO. But like even right there, you can see that tiny little dimple. Let's see if I can get it just right. There. 
see the little dimple on the left that came from on our graph over here this little region right there like that little duck beak so I mean this is this is just really cool like even now as I'm frustrated from having to redo the video this is a really really cool thing so there we go we've got our solid got this weird crazy discus kind of shape or disc kind of shape and so it appears that we have found all our stuff so without any further ado hoping that this time the video will work this is Mr. Steel and I am signing off